Welcome everyone um, to uh, what will be uh, uh, one of, uh, I hope, uh, many future conflict records uh, unit uh, events, workshops, conferences, seminars, seminar series. Uh, and we've already had uh, quite a program um, since its foundation. And I'll, I'll ask Mike to, to, to comment on that in a moment. Uh, I'm Professor Joe Maiolo from the Department of War Studies, Professor of International History. Uh, and I'm also uh, a co-director of the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War, which is where the uh, Conflict Records Unit um, is housed. And I would just say, of course, that uh, it's, it's extremely appropriate that the Conflict Records Unit sits within the Sir Michael Howard Center. Sir Michael Howard, um, uh, for those of you who are unaware, uh, was a uh, historian of war who founded the Department of War Studies back in the early 1960s at King's College London. Uh, he had been uh, a guards officer in the Second World War and fought up the uh, uh, Italian Peninsula in the Second World War. So had been both experienced war, written about war, and I think documented war. So an entirely appropriate uh, uh, moment uh, to reflect on what documenting war means at precisely this moment. Uh, and particularly within the uh, Department of War Studies. Um, first of all, before we we we, we kick off with our, our uh, with Mike, uh, 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 who will give a bit of an intellectual framework for the day. What I would want to do is I want to thank uh, Ellie has dropped out, uh, but Ellie Begnell is the person who has been behind all of the uh, fundamental arrangements. Uh, she uh, uh, is part of our fantastic team. Uh, in the uh, Department of War, uh, War Studies that, that makes events happen, our events team. Um, and so we have her to thank. I'd like to thank uh, Andreas Muller, who's, uh, I, I think here, uh, yes, there he is, who um, I think all, every, all the participants will know from the various email shots and keeping things uh, organized. And ultimately, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mike Innes, uh, who um, uh, 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 framed the ideas and uh, initiated both the uh, conflict records unit and this conference. So uh, uh, just a couple of ho uh, minor housekeeping uh, issues. Um, one, I just wanna let everybody know that um, we will be recording and I'll keep the recording uh, running uh, the whole time. In breaks, we won't shut down the webinar uh, because first of all, I, I don't, not sure I, I could be able to necessarily initiate it again. So let's not do that. We'll keep the webinar running. I'll just put up the, the program on the screen and that way you'll know that um, we are just in a break and that the panels will resume shortly. For participants um, on, on the webinar, uh, unless your, your panel is running, can you uh, please keep your um, mics muted and your cameras off so that, um, the, those sitting in the um, participants or the, the audience gallery will uh, know who's, who's panelist and who isn't. Uh, for participants, so the, the people who are participating in the webinar, if you have questions uh, during the Q&A sessions of the panels, please do switch off, uh, switch your mics on and your, your cameras on and, and, and join us that way. It's kind of nice to have a, a sense of a discussion across panels. Now, for those of you who are joining us in the audience room, the participants room, the, the Q&A function uh, is working and we will, we will be keeping an eye on that, uh, obviously, particularly during the Q&A sessions. So please, uh, at any time, because uh, it's an open function, just feel free to pop your questions in there. And uh, we'll, uh, if you have any uh, messages or um, things you want to alert us to, please, please feel free to use the Q&A function for that. And I think that is everything, Mike. So over to you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I mean, I'm blushing a little bit for that generous introduction. Maybe if we could just add a housekeeping point, uh, the obvious one being uh, about connectivity. Uh, I'm, I'm dialing in from Baghdad. Others will be dialing in from all sorts of interesting locations. Um, you know, if you, if you get bumped, if your connectivity breaks, uh, especially when you're speaking, if you're speaking, if you're in the middle of your own uh, paper and things break, we'll pause, we'll wait for you. Um, just try to log back in. We'll wait a few minutes, uh, a respectful amount of time. And um, if it looks like uh, it's unrecoverable, then we'll try to you know, revisit that uh, afterwards and, and carry on with the conference. Um, I've already had one connectivity break this morning. Um, hopefully, hopefully it should be pretty stable uh, and fingers crossed it's stable over the next hour and a half. Uh, 
for an hour and a quarter while I'm, I'm discussing for the, the first panel. Um, Right, so uh, I, I'm Mike Kinnis. I'm a visiting senior research fellow in the Department of War Studies, wearing my academic hat. Uh, in my non-academic professional hat, I am a what's broadly uh, and, and, uh, and, and vaguely framed as a UN official. Uh, I work with the UN investigative team for accountability of Daesh in Iraq. Uh, it is essentially a fact-finding and investigative mission meant to collect and preserve evidence of Daesh uh, Commission of Core International Crimes, uh, by which we mean, of course, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, and crimes that constitute those larger, uh, those larger crimes. Uh, I'm speaking a, on, a, on a personal basis, but of course, a, a lot of what, I, uh, a lot of what uh, I do on the research side, on the academic side, is driven by um, uh, quite a bit of practice experience uh, in the Balkans, Afghanistan, and, and now Iraq and, and other places as well. Um, I, I think a lot of that went into, you know, setting up the conflict records unit. So, so quite a few of you will already be familiar with the background. Um, the conflict records unit was set up in late 2020 uh, after discussions between myself and Joe and this real interest as historians in uh, how war is documented, how we use primary sources, the methods we use, um, and, and as, as kind of a maybe a parallel to other high profile uh, focuses on uh, different kinds of public history, I suppose, or applied history where, you know, there's, there's a lot of work on bringing in a, a more historically informed approach to uh, current conflicts and policymaking and what have you. Um, and in our view, it, it tended, all of that tended to neglect, you know, the, the practical aspects of this, the, the, the methods -y side of things, how we go about collecting evidence and preserving evidence, what evidence even means, um, you know, it can mean quite a few different things depending on where you're coming from, what discipline you're coming from, or what domain or what sort of practice um, you're involved with. So, so the idea is to set this up in a very multidisciplinary sort of way, but housed uh, within the Sir Michael Howard Center, uh, precisely because we're, we're coming at this initially as, as historians, um, and, and, uh, and that's our start point, but it's not our end point. Um, Joe mentioned that we, we've already had quite a, you know, we, we, we ran a, a speaker series uh, over the last year, uh, and, and our approach to this was pretty exploratory. We didn't come at it with a, a narrowly defined agenda um, or with any particular sorts of questions. I have a few questions of my own that I tend to bring into these, but otherwise we took a very exploratory sort of approach to this thing that, that you know, is variously referred to as conflict records or conflict archives or captured enemy documents or um, indeed the frame of this conference, which is, or, or this, this, today's, today's uh, events, which is documenting more. Um, um, and, and we understand those terms as broadly as you'd like them to be understood, uh, just so that we can, you know, take an initial broad, uh, broad, broad brush to all of this, and 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 uh, and then uh, you know narrow things down as we go along. So very exploratory, um, very wide coverage, a lot of really interesting um, topics and speakers, including a couple who are who are here today, elaborating on what they've they've already spoken about, and contributing to the larger conversation. So today's today's event really serves as both. Uh, both kind of a, a capstone to the last year's events, but also as a, a prod for future research. And in, in the call for papers, we mentioned that we're very interested in putting together, um, you know, an, an edited collection uh, that would have as its start point some of what gets presented today, but uh, building out from there as well. So uh, we're very interested in, in trying to maybe set the agenda uh, or, or actually try to define what the agenda is um, and, and, uh, and take it from there. So, so it, it's... Um, Today, coming out of this uh, series over 2021-2022, actually started in May of 2021, um, and leading up to today, we haven't yet to find what we'll do next year or the year after, but there will be more to follow. Um, and hopefully this, um, it, you know, can bring in a lot of what was covered over the last year, add yet more to it, and, and, uh, and, and push things forward. So I'm feeling quite ambitious and optimistic about that and really looking forward to it. Today's paper, um, Pat, the, 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 the panels and the paper topics really reflect, reflect <clears throat> sorry, I can do this, this, uh, this broad interest, right? This very exploratory approach. So we're covering a lot of different region, regions. We've allowed for quite a few disciplines. 
um, and, and historical periods, uh, indeed. And, and you know, while they're they're driven by some very contemporary issues, um, you know, anybody looking at any any given uh, bit of political violence or conflict now can't can't help but be struck by how easy it is to record and to document. Um, and indeed formal uh, and organized efforts to document conflicts for all sorts of purposes, whether it's um, purely purely and altruistically historical purposes or driven by something more specific like, you know, uh, capturing in real time evidence of, of core international crimes or, or what have you. Um, th those are, those, you know, the, the, it's a very contemporary set of issues, but there's some pretty, I think some pretty, what I think of uh, as some fairly fundamental sort of questions um, that can help shape things. And we've tried to organize the panels, today's panels around that. Um, you know, panel one uh, is really looking at, at some of the origins of those contemporary practices um, and, uh, you know, indeed what they can tell us about, um, you know, current, current priorities and, and, uh, and, and more, I suppose, forecasting or prospective kind of practices where uh, documentation comes into play. Um, panel two looks looks at uh, it takes a more explicit look at, at uh, you know history and the courts um, and particularly international law and and, and and as this relates to use of different kinds of evidence and, and use of uh, use of that evidence in particular kinds of cases um, you know this this ties very closely to a question that's been close to my heart for the last couple of years and that is um, you know, this idea that there's a forensic aesthetic or an investigative aesthetic that's, that's been in play for some time. Anybody who's read Ail Weitzman's work on this understands it or pays attention to things like forensic architecture or indeed other, other like entities out there um, that are doing research. But, you know, the forensic, a forensic standard seems to be kind of the, a default uh, or a growing, there's a growing sense that a forensic standard should be a default if for anybody doing research in uh, difficult areas because of the potential implications of what is being researched uh, for for human rights or or or, or war crimes or, or genocide prosecutions. So is that is that a is that a, a default that's fair? What are, what are the kind of issues that that come up when when that becomes a default for people who are otherwise not meant to be or or not intend to investigate um, or, or research issues as criminal acts per se? Um, and panel, panels three and four look at uh, different cases uh, and tell us about which which can tell us about problems of, of access and evidence. There are other kinds of you know fundamental issues that they can tell us about as well. But the way we framed it here, uh, in part because of um, you know the the way you framed your own papers and the kinds of research that you're doing as as, as panelists, um, you know what can that tell us about problems of access, which is something that is always a problem for. I suppose uh, researchers who may not have privileged access to uh, more more difficult uh, operating environments, uh, you know, academics in particular have very strict codes of ethics and and uh, and and ethics boards and, and and reviews that they have to pass through to be able to do research, and access can cannot be you know treated as a given, whereas others will you know by virtue of their remits uh, be be quite embedded in those difficult to operate uh, in, in environments. So problems of access are, are fairly key. And types of evidence and how evidence is handled and, um, and, and, and preserved and stored and used, those are all things that come up and they come up increasingly um, and, and prominently in relation to uh, more contemporary conflicts. But uh, going back to panel one and panel two, there's, there's quite a bit that can be learned for how this has been done in the past. Um, and, and seeing actually some, some of the practices are no different, but um, you know, there, there are uh, differences of technology and, and access and other issues that, that do come into play. So seeing how these things play out over the long term uh, is especially appropriate to, to a, the conflict records unit and to something that's done within the, um, within the context of the Sir Michael Howard Center. Um, I think that's, that's all I wanna say in terms of setting the, the stage or setting the frame for, for today. And I think with that, we're right on time actually to, to go right into the first panel. Um, and so that's what I'll do. Um, I'll just go through introductions first. I'll set a couple of uh, broad frames and then I'll uh, open the space for the three panelists uh, to, to present their papers and we'll go into Q&A after that. I would just ask you to, again, just to remind you for, uh, for any questions, post your questions into the Q&A function and those will be brought into, uh, brought into the discussion. We're probably looking, we're looking at, at 15 minutes per paper, more or less. Uh, 
Um, but what we want to do is, is, is over this hour and a quarter is, um, you know, have about 45 minutes for speaking, about half an hour for, for Q&A. Um, you know, we can play with that time a little bit, um, but that's, that's what we're looking at from now until uh, 10.45 UK time. Um, so with that, going straight into the introductions, I've already introduced myself. Uh, I have three panelists on this first panel, which is on the what's been what I've what framed broadly as the Anglo-American experience, past, present, and future. Uh, panelists are Jeff Michaels, who is a senior fellow in the Institute of International Studies and a fellow, I think Jeff, still a fellow with the uh, this department. Uh, Timothy Heck, U.S. Marine Corps Reserve, and uh, Matthew. Uh, Ford, who's a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex, and also uh, a long, has a long time connection to the War Studies Department. I don't know if it's a current one as well, uh, as well as uh, many other places, including formerly West Point and a few other uh, places. Um, I think, it, I, I hope I've captured that accurately. Jeff, Jeff and, and Matthew, I know you both quite well, so I, I know I have Timothy. Um, I, I've, I've presented what I have of your bio. Uh, each of you, if you want to present a little bit more about yourselves, um, you know, when it's time to present your paper, please, <clears throat> please feel free to do so. Um, in terms of this panel, I just want to set um, you know, sort of a broad frame and then a, a slightly broader frame, and then, and then I'll stop talking. Uh, I'm just the discussant, I'm not a presenter. Um, so I guess, I guess in terms of what we want to achieve or things that we want to look at with this, with this first panel um, is, is um, you know, lo longer term histories of, of two things. Um, and and this, this is really my interest in, in, in this longer term history and understanding the origins of contemporary practices. Uh, it goes to two things, right? What, one is, one is um, you know, document exploitation or more recently document and media exploitation, DOCX and DOMEX respectively, as part of a Western sort of intelligence practice. Um, and the other, the other is, is post-war and post-genocide efforts to document core international crimes. Both of these have, have long histories. Both of them sort of intersect and have evolved in, in separate and distinct ways. And so my own interest is, is in how these have evolved over time. And I think there'll be elements of these you'll see in some of the uh, presentations this morning. The, the broader frame for this, uh, I, I think, is, is you know, how do organizations learn? How do they produce knowledge? Organizations in particular that are uh, by design meant to be operating in, 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 a, in a war context. Uh, and I think Timothy, Timothy's um, paper will speak to this quite explicitly. Um, so, so the longer term histories, that's, that's one aspect of this. How do, how do organizations uh, learn and, and produce knowledge more generally? Um, and another question is what about the tech, right? I, we can't talk about this, uh, this sort of issue, especially you know, over the last, well, probably 20, 30 years now without talking about you know, advances in technology and information technology and what that means for our ability, our capacity to, to handle large volumes of data or high volumes of, of information. And, and um, you know, this, this is something that I always find striking because while, while this is all real, we're, we're all equipped with mobile phones, we're all equipped with all sorts of technology, we're operating virtually with, you know, with uh, equipment that allows us to, um, to do all this, but, you know, there are still counter examples and my own work, I, you know, there's not a lot I can say about it, but what I can say is that, you know, the, the, the premise that information is, is automatically electronic and AI is the solution that tends to be kind of the, you know, one of the, one of the headline sort of um, uh, frames for this sort of thing. Um, always runs, I, I guess, falls short of reality in, in the places where I work, where the large volumes of information you're dealing with tend to be with analog media. Uh, in, in my current work, my, you know, I'm a head of unit with UNITAD that's responsible for um, it's referred to colloquially within the mission as the digitization project. And it's really about converting millions and millions. I mean, we've estimated 20 to 25 million pages of paper documents, as well as physical artifacts and other kinds of material uh, into digitally usable surrogates, right? Um, and if you don't do that, it doesn't matter how much AI you have, you, you can't use it. I mean, you have to make, you have to convert media types. Um, that itself is complicated by things like some of the software, some of the technologies that do enable this, they only really work well in a Western context. 
they don't work well with non-English language media or non-Western language media. They, they really don't work with Arabic in particular in this context. Um, and, and they don't work well with handwritten uh, documents. So things like optical, you know, optical character recognition fall short. And that's, that's not even AI, that's you know, basic sort of stuff. So what about the tech? What, what about the media? What about the, you know, the kinds of media that the you know, information is, is stored on or, or is held in? What are, you know, what are the sort of countervailing tendencies that we see because of this um, or, or, or in, in sort of the orbit of the, these kinds of issues? Um, and the last, the last point I'll put out there, just to bring Matthew's work uh, more closely into the frame, um, is what does this mean, if anything, for the future, right? Collecting evidence and producing knowledge involves looking back at the past. It, 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 it's about helping make decisions about uh, the now and, and informs how we prepare for the future, right? Uh, and so um, I, I think there's, there's some interesting um, constellation of, of, of subject matter and implications between Jeff Michaels, Timothy Heck, and Matthew Ford this morning as a panel in its own right, but as a way of setting up the day as well. Uh, as, we, as we get into other panels later, we'll, we'll see uh, some of those issues recurring, uh, I hope. Anyways, so that, that's it for me. I'll stop, I'll stop uh, now and, um, and Q, I think we'll go in the order that the, uh, if you don't mind, uh, go in the order listed in the agenda. And if Jeff, if you want to, um, step up, the, the, the mic is yours, and then we'll go to Tim, uh, and then to Matthew. And sure. Will... Um, so I'm not sure, can you see my screen at the moment? I can, yes. Okay, let me just uh, fix that there. Right. Um, yeah, the screen's on. Screen's on, excellent. Um, so, uh, well, first off, thank you, Mike, for the kind invitation to present uh, my research at this conference. Um, my presentation is somewhat unusual in the sense that I'm not talking about documenting war per se, but much of what I will be discussing, I think still relates very closely to wartime acquisition and exploitation of documents. Indeed, the system for procuring publications by US intelligence agencies during the Cold War and specifically Chinese publications was very much an outgrowth of the system devised by the US government during the Second World War. Also, you know, although as I'll briefly mention, it goes back much earlier. Um, so what I hope to do with my presentation is address a number of themes that I think overlap with documenting war, including government strategies for acquiring documentary sources in the first place. How do you actually get documents? How do you obtain these from a state that doesn't want to give them away where there's no official diplomatic representation where there is no access, as Mike just mentioned. Um, I'll address some of the practical problems with translating material, uh, again, as Michael just mentioned, especially when it's received in bulk, uh, and then organizing it, cataloging it, et cetera, which are problems that exist in war or no war. Um, I'll talk about the value of open sources, and here I'm specifically referring to uh, newspapers, magazines, journals, and books both for intelligence analysis, but just as importantly, for developing an expert community. When it comes to US analysis of China, uh, there was very much an intelligence academic nexus. Uh, notably, the systematic study of contemporary China was not a priority for uh, American universities prior to the Cold War. And it basically had to be created more or less from scratch. And in the absence of access to contemporary documents coming out of China, uh, you simply could not create any meaningful research on this topic. And in that sense, the US intelligence community plays a vital role in developing the academic field. Uh, and sort of more, more, more generally, I think, you know, all too often in academia, we're not as reflective as we probably should be about how much our research is dependent on the databases, the archives, and the libraries we have access to. In that sense, our worldviews, what it is we research, what we think we know about subject to X, Y, or Z, is fundamentally shaped by our access to sources. Uh, it's a reality that I've been painfully reminded of working at a university here in Barcelona, where the library's collections on the subjects that I work on are quite limited. Uh, we're not from my remote access to the Bodleian system in Oxford or having access to uh, Amazon. Uh, quite frankly, I'd be completely screwed and would have to find myself a new profession. So, so let, me, let me begin by making a couple of, of, of background points. 
the first point is that the acquisition of open sources from an American perspective at least, goes right back to the beginning, back to the War of Independence. Despite the emphasis within intelligence studies, uh, much less the work of more sensationalist authors, Hollywood script writers and so forth, which tend to focus on spies doing sort of hardcore spying. The fact of the matter is, you know, at least for you know, George Washington, uh, newspapers were a major source of intelligence. But you know, the thing about this, which I don't think is properly appreciated and also relates directly to the procurement of Chinese publications is that overt sources should not be equated with overt procurement. Um, in this 1780 engraving by the French artist Jean-Baptiste Le Pont, uh, you see a close-up of Washington and you can see various British proclamations, uh, et cetera. But you know, how does Washington actually get these to his headquarters out in the field, uh, presumably in New Jersey at this time, along with newspapers, as well as whatever other intelligence he receives? Well, I mean, it basically it's, it's, it's smuggled across British lines and a really example of, of a clandestine operation to acquire newspapers and other documents. Uh, the same thing was done uh, incidentally by both sides during the American Civil War. But prior to World War II, there wasn't any large scale US operation, at least mounted on a global scale to collect documents about a foreign adversary. And here I'm not merely talking about a dedicated intelligence organization like OSS. What emerges in World War II is an intelligence-led coordinated program across the US government, which was designed to collect foreign documents, primarily dealing with, with the Axis countries, especially Germany. Um, but in practice, what did this amount to? Uh, it amounted to setting up a system in all the neutral countries, <clears throat> Switzerland, Sweden, Turkey, et cetera, to gather as many newspapers, magazines, books, and so forth from inside Germany and the occupied countries. And they'd be microfilmed, or at least mostly microfilmed, and sent back to the US where analysts could exploit them for intelligence, whether it was political intelligence, military, economic, scientific, and so on, and also exploited for their propaganda value. Uh, this system was coordinated by the Interdepartmental Committee for the Acquisition of Foreign Publications, or IDC, which was run by a librarian working for the OSS. And if you want to learn more about this, I can highly recommend this book. Uh, by Kathy Pice, which only came out about a year or so ago. And basically what happens is that this model of collecting open sources is utilized during the Cold War. Uh, there's a similar committee to the IDC, although it's sort of named different things at different times. And this committee deals with the direction and coordination of the acquisition and exploitation of foreign, pol uh, foreign publications uh, across the US government. Um, there are a number of important actors within the government I'd like to single out. Probably the most important was the US State Department and, and its system of publications procurement officers who were stationed around the world and whose job it was to buy documents and have them shipped to the United States. And these were State Department officers, um, or rather, sort of, although these were State Department officers, their purchases were uh, reimbursed by the CIA and they were often being directed by the agency in terms of what sort of books and, and so forth to look out for and buy. In the Soviet Union, for instance, there were usually three publications procurement officers at any one time who literally went into the bookstores in Moscow, Leningrad, and across the country, uh, went to newspaper and magazine kiosks and bought up everything that was related to topics of interest to the intelligence community. But it wasn't just Soviet material inside the Soviet Union, it was also Soviet materials outside the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe or further afield. And I should say it was also Chinese material inside the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, actually, one of the key problems the US had with collecting Chinese materials, uh, unlike in the Soviet Union, was that without an embassy in China, it was unable to go around China collecting documents. So it had to find other ways. And this was a key reason why the procurement officer in Hong Kong becomes such an important figure and to a much lesser extent the procurement officer in Tokyo. Of course, there were also, in terms of other actors, the military attache system and military intelligence units uh, stations around the world collecting newspapers. For instance, when we think about Soviet military publications, newspapers like uh, Krasnaya Zvezda, uh, Red Star, being studied by analysts back in Washington, they only get to Washington because some attache in Moscow goes out to the kiosk every day 
buys lots of copies, and then they're shipped in a diplomatic pouch, along with copies of his Vestia, Pravda, and so on, for analysis the next day back in Washington. Uh, likewise, for instance, uh, the service libraries, the army library, for example, play uh, important roles. Uh, this aspect of intelligence collection and analysis, as I mentioned, has, has basically received no, next to no attention. Uh, the only instance in a feature film that I've been able to find uh, where it is referred to was from this uh, 1973 film, The Serpent, also known as um, Night Flight from Moscow, where they briefly discuss what goes on at CIA headquarters and allocate an amazing 22 seconds the collection and analysis of communist publications. Um, the CIA had its foreign documents division, which was responsible for collecting and exploiting documents. Although I think the more important organization in terms of direction and coordination was actually the CIA library. Uh, this is actually the old CIA headquarters here before they moved to Langley. Uh, and as you can see here, what they refer to, this is the, the CIA library's own in-house history. It says that it was uh, in December of 1950 that the CIA, CIA library um, uh, was given responsibility for publications procurement, uh, that they would use the commercial book trade, US government facilities and covert means uh, in special cases. Um, you'll never see the Library of Congress listed as part of the intelligence community, but nevertheless, it played a very important intelligence role uh, I would single out the Air Information Division of the Library of Congress um, in terms of exploitation of foreign documents, as you can see here. Um, it says, um, you know, basically there are only two large groups in the US government engaged in the exploitation of foreign language publications. One is the Foreign Documents Division of CIA, and the other is the Air Information Division of the Library of Congress. Um, the division was mainly concerned uh, with Soviet and Eastern European documents and didn't do too much with Chinese documents. Um, although they did do some, as you can see from here from this example, uh, a survey of scientific and technical monographs published in China. Um, two things I think that are interesting about the Library of Congress. The first is that prior to the Cold War, uh, their interest in Chinese books was mainly centered on ancient texts. Um, after 1949, however, the emphasis switches to contemporary China and their, collect their collections expand considerably and they're given a lot of funding for this. Uh, actually, this, this picture is a bit deceptive. It's not the Library of Congress, it's actually the Hoover Institution where they're uh, uh, taking out and cataloging lots of Chinese books that they just received around, I think around 1949, 1950. Um, the second the Library of Congress becomes the repository for most of the Chinese materials gathered by other agencies. And there are two reasons for this. Uh, the obvious one is simply a matter of storage. Uh, the more important one though, is that what you see in relation to sort of broader US efforts to understand China is this recognition that what the US lacks is not simply analysts working for the intelligence agencies, but they're lacking national expertise on contemporary China more generally and that such expertise cannot be developed without documentary sources, especially if you want to build a field of contemporary China studies. Thus, the people needed to study China, to analyze it, are unable to do so without a steady source of documents to, to work with. Uh, one statistic I found quite interesting was that by 1959, the Chinese collection at the Library of Congress had between about 30 to 35,000 books and pamphlets from communist China. But it was so many that nearly half of them were still uncatalogued. There was a two-year backlog. Although we often focus a lot on analysis, the basic problem of transporting, cataloging, and translating massive amounts of material, this very large infrastructure, um, is something, you know, all, all the stuff that goes on in the background is something that I think we still know very little about. Um, here, for instance, you get a sense of the challenge. Uh, this figure I find quite unbelievable. Um, and perhaps it's just an error, but one full page of a Chinese newspaper to be fully exploited would require two weeks for one analyst, with the problem being that the CIA was, was receiving 30 Chinese newspapers a day and 50 periodicals per month. And just to give you a sense of the size and the scope of the China operation alone, and to emphasize this was much smaller than the, than the acquisition of Soviet documents, 
As you can see here in 1959, um, 68 newspaper titles were received as well as 390 journal titles. Uh, this declines the following year uh, a bit, probably due to the, the publication's export ban uh, during that period that the Chinese government imposed. I'd also direct your attention to the final line, which is that to, to receive the journals in Washington, there's a time lag of between three to four weeks and three to four months. Uh, anyway, you know, that's the period it takes for these materials to be shipped and exploited back and back to Washington. Um, but before they even reach Washington, many of the newspapers which were acquired uh, in Hong Kong were exploited locally in Hong Kong at the Consulate General. Uh, the Hong Kong effort began in 1950 when they began putting out a publication called the Survey of the China Mainland Press, which became the standard source of reference for the government and um, in the academic community. As you can see here, this last line that I've, I've highlighted in red referring to uh, a number of the publications coming out of Hong Kong uh, where one uh, sort of China watcher says that these five publications were our holy scriptures, eagerly perused by, by China watch watchers everywhere in the English speaking world. Um, producing this was the responsibility uh, of the Hong Kong Press Monitoring Unit, which had about 10 translators and 20 typists, and they would churn out about 60 to 70 pages of single spaced uh, sheets of paper every day. They also put out a number of other publications dealing with more in-depth uh, sort of research on certain topics, uh, as well as a similar survey of Chinese magazines. Uh, Hong Kong at this time really is the principal hub for the procurement of Chinese publications and also for the ana analysis of the Chinese press. And this continues even after the US sets up a liaison office uh, in Beijing in 1973, which is so small initially that it simply doesn't have the people to go out and buy newspapers and ship them back. It's only in 1979 when the US finally sets up an embassy in Beijing that Hong Kong begins to lose its important role as the center for China watching. So in my remaining time, and I only have a couple minutes left, I think I'll also just briefly discuss three issues before concluding. Um, the first is how did the US officials in Hong Kong get documents out of China? Well, basically the short answer is mainly through smuggling. Uh, officials had connections with all sorts of book dealers and news agents in Hong Kong who had contacts on the mainland that were able to supply them with newspapers, books, et cetera, uh, for, for a price. To a lesser extent, the US tapped into other sources, um, such as in Japan. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is a report from 1951, referencing a bookstore in Tokyo, which has very close connections uh, with the communist Chinese. Incidentally, this bookstore, um, which existed in China uh, um, uh, up until the end of the, uh, uh, Second World War, they moved back to Tokyo. I think it only recently reopened in China uh, itself. And in addition to going through various dealers, the US also had people to go to locations in Hong Kong that were frequented by refugees and other travelers uh, to the mainland, trying to find any documents they were carrying with them, uh, perhaps offering to buy them, looking for discarded newspapers and so on. Uh, one US official stated that newspapers, especially provincial newspapers, would often be wrapped around fish. Among the most useful newspapers were the People's Daily and the Communist Party journal uh, Red Flag. Um, during the Cultural Revolution, there was a great effort placed on Red Guard publications, uh, including wall posters. As one official put it, wall posters and Red Guard newspapers became the most sought after sources of information. They were in great demand. Our embassy friends in Peking obliged ripping them from the walls, shards of concrete and all, and stuffing them in the diplomatic pouch. Uh, scholars in the field of contemporary China studies credited this procurement effort as essential to the development of the academic field. And in addition to the Hong Kong effort, as I said, the US was collecting documents from elsewhere, uh, both in the communist bloc and further afield. Uh, for instance, I saw one reference to US officials finding Chinese uh, scientific publications in the National Library of Finland. Uh, China at that time did, did maintain some library exchange agreements with other countries. So in terms of exploitation, there was the intelligence community on the one hand and academia on the other. With regards to the latter, um, materials were often made available, at least initially to the Library of Congress and then to the Hoover Institution and leading universities with China programs, such as Harvard and Columbia. Um, 
For the intelligence community, it was mainly a matter of utilizing and adapting the techniques of propaganda analysis they'd used to study Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, as well as Kremlinology. Basically, to gain as much political intelligence as possible from these documents, uh, as one official stated, what we were doing was poring over text, looking at the language, looking at the adjectives, the adverbs, with the knowledge that what was coming out of the official press was supposed to be guidance for the cadres throughout the country. You got the big picture most of the time, you didn't get the details. I should also emphasize there was a good deal of economic intelligence, biographical intelligence, scientific intelligence, and so on uh, to, be to be obtained from these documents. Uh, one amusing anecdote I came across was of a US official who was, who was asked to translate a book on ornithology. Uh, it wasn't this book that you see here in the picture. Uh, that was the only book that I could actually, uh, the only sort of publication that I could find uh, referring to Chinese birds. Um, this was part of a translation program funded by the CIA. And when the official asked why the CIA were interested in the birds of China, as you can see here, he was told that it was one of the things they were using to monitor Chinese nuclear testing. So to conclude, in terms of the, the overall value of this effort to the, to the intelligence community, at least, there's no doubt that the open sources obtained through this procurement system was responsible for the vast majority of intelligence produced on China. Uh, one senior official referred to the Chinese mainland press as, quote, our key source. Another official noted that although clandestine sources and methods existed, quote, the yield was limited. Uh, another senior intelligence official uh, said that the CIA had no good sources of information. And to the extent that there were differences among the various anal analytical products uh, of the different US intelligence agencies, there were essentially differences over interpretation of the same people's daily editorial. Uh, and finally, sort of one, 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 one other official said that uh, although the National Security Agency was monitoring Chinese communications and that this intelligence was, quote, somewhat helpful, that they actually found open sources to be the most valuable source. Um, I should also point out that another crucial open source were radio broadcasts, which were monitored by uh, FIBIS, the Foreign Broadcast uh, Information Service. But this was a separate operation from the publication's uh, procurement. Uh, where I think all this leads, and this is my final point, is that we still have a long way to go in terms of appreciating the value of basic sources of information, and especially in the field of intelligence studies. And beyond that, there is a need to study the infrastructure behind it. In that sense, if, you know, if we really want a better appreciation of what constitutes intelligence, we need to switch our focus from the, sort of the, the sensational to the mundane. And I would also like to say that it was precisely the existence of this infrastructure that made US intelligence, at least infrastructure on this scale, uh, sort of this global network, uh, that made US intelligence rather unique. Uh, and I'll stop there. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Jeff. That, I, I'm familiar with a lot of what you, you just presented, but not all of it. It, it. it was fascinating. I'll just reiterate for any uh, participants who joined since we started. I see, I see a hand raised. Thanks. Um, for any questions, we're just going to proceed through the three papers and then open it up to Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A. Uh, they'll be moderated and, and uh, presented to the presenters for, for discussion after that. We already have one, one really interesting question. I'm sure to have some more. So just use that Q&A function for any questions you have for the, for the panelists, and those will come up uh, once we're through the, the, the three papers. Um, Tim, uh, you're up. Good morning, thank you. Give me a second, let me share my screen. And, oh goodness, hang on. Presenting to ah. Nope, not what I wanted to do. I've got, I've got the Zoom window thing down here at the bottom that's presenting me from seeing what I want to see. So give me one second. There we go. All right. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Shoot. All right, so I'm going to show you that. <clears throat> 
and pull up my paper. All right. I am so sorry about this. It is five o'clock in the morning. I'm not fully awake yet. So good morning. My name is Tim Heck. I'm a joint historian with Marine Corps History Division. Um, and that is my reserve obligation and my reserve duty. So first, I want to lead with a disclaimer that says I am uh, presenting absolutely unofficially here. The, the views expressed here do not reflect the official position of the United States Marine Corps, Marine Corps History Division, or the United States government. They're solely those of the author, which is me. In July 2019, General David H. Berger released the Commandant's Planning Guidance, which outlined an intent to execute significant changes for the U.S. Marine Corps. His first priority was a force transformation. Ultimately codified as Force Design 2030, the changes he proposed were near seismic in nature. Explicitly couched in terms of the interwar period of the 1920s and 1930s, Force Design 2030 seeks to adapt the force after years of counterinsurgency warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan. Tasked with collecting the history of that change, Marine Corps History Division is actively collecting primary source material to develop a fuller picture of the changes and efforts underway. This paper breaks down the elements of Force Design 2030, the role and organization of Marine Corps History Division, and the impact of the past, the past three years have had on the Marine Corps in collecting historical material. Shortly after, starting shortly after the attacks of September 11th, 2001, the U.S. Marine Corps began a period of nonstop combat operations in Afghanistan and Iraq that only ended with the withdrawal from Hamid Karzai International Airport in August of 2021. And indeed, there are still Marines in Iraq currently. Indeed, for the last few years of America's involvement in Afghanistan, there were troops that were posted there that were born after the events of 9-11. As such, at least a generation of Marine Corps leadership knew nothing but consistent deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, relatively wide open budgets, and counterinsurgency warfare. Central to the pre-9-11 Marine Corps, and still operationally and foundationally relevant today, is the Marine Expeditionary Unit. The Marine Corps has seven, also referred to as MUs. The Marine Corps has seven MUs, the 11th, 13th, 15th, 22nd, 24th, 26th, and 31st. Why we don't know in the one through seven, I don't know. These MUSE exist, are in existence, and they rotate on Navy ships throughout the world, conducting a variety of missions during their six months at sea. They're part of the Marine Air Ground Task Force. They're America's projected response force. Two MUSE, for example, linked up off the coast of Pakistan and started American conventional operations against the Taliban in late 2001. The MU, however, had shifted focus so that by 2006, it was not uncommon for MUs to never see a ship on their deployment, instead headed directly to Iraq or Afghanistan to own battle space. These dirt MUs were symptomatic of the Marine Corps at the time. The nation needed boots on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan and turned to its Marine Corps to execute these missions. The winding down of combat operations in the late 20 teens saw a shift in the role of the Marine Corps. It was a period of a variety of visions of what the Marine Corps should, was, or should be. Leo Spader, in his fantastic piece, Sir, Who Am I?, an open letter to the, to the incoming commandant of the Marine Corps in War on the Rocks, remarked on the ambiguity present in the Marine Corps planning and directional circles. He wrote, quote, at headquarters Marine Corps, I have heard and read a dizzying array of what we are doing, pursuing, and becoming. Not much of it is coherent. General Purpose Force. Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations Force, paced against a specific threat, no pacing threat, applicable to all combatant commands, urban and megacities, jungle, sea control, forcible entry operations, amphibious, expeditionary, naval, crisis responders, contact force, blunt force, surge force, heavy, light, etc. I could go on, but it's starting to feel absurd. Unsurprisingly, Spader received a variety of feedback on his article in places like War on the Rocks, the Modern War Institute, the Marine Corps Gazette, and others. When General Berger became Commandant, he saw the need for change. No longer was the Marine Corps going to be a second land army fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Instead, it was going to return to its maritime roots. The threat to the United States was no longer predominantly violent extremist organizations or insurgents in the dusty cities of Iraq, or mountainous valleys of Afghanistan. 
Instead, the Marine Corps needed to pivot itself to address great power competition and peer or near peer threats. After two decades of total domination of the skies and the electromagnetic spectrum, the Marine Corps identified pacing threats in China and Russia, with additional threats coming from North Korea and Iran. General Berger discussed Force Design 2030 in a simple document released in March 2020, a document that's only 15 pages in length. The follow on to his planning guidance issued in 2019. He stated, quote, such a profound shift in missions from inland to littoral and from non state actor to peer competitor necessarily requires substantial adjustments in how we organize, train, and equip our Corps. A return to our historic role in the, the maritime littoral will also demand greater integration with the Navy and a reaffirmation of that strategic partnership. As a consequence, we must transform our traditional models for organizing, training, and equipping the force to meet, newly desired, to meet new desired ends and do so in full partnership with the Navy. The organization of the Marine Corps, he stated, had basically not changed since the 1950s, and it was time to see that fixed. General Berger based his analysis and plan in a variety of foundational documents for, the national, for national security, including the 2018 version of the National Defense Strategy. The intellectual heritage, Berger remarked in his May 2022 update to Force Design 2030, goes back further to experiments in the 1990s and concepts for distributed operations and maneuver warfare released in the early 2000s. Three lines of efforts can be identified as part of Force Design 2030. The first is conceptual and intellectual. These changes represent a change in thought or tenant in how the Marine Corps operates or frames the operating environment. The second line of effort is a force structure and organizational change. These are the Marines and equipment changes that needed to be implemented as part of the Force Design 2030 efforts. The third is an experimentation and analysis shift that provides an iterative model an iterative model for who and what the Marine Corps needs to be for the next fight. First, looking at the doctrinal products that have come out of Force Design 2030, it is apparent that a large volume of intellectual capital has been expended to determine where we are going and why. General Berger has answered Spader's statement without, about ambiguity and multiple personality disorder in the Marine Corps quite clearly. The pacing threat is the People's Republic of China. The Marine Corps is hard at work addressing that threat and defining intellectual and conceptual ways to do so. From May 2021 to May 2022, the Marine Corps released two major publications, a concept for stand-in forces and a functional concept for maritime reconnaissance and counter-reconnaissance. Forthcoming publications include a functional concept for MAGTAF, the Marine Air Ground Task Force, Air and Missile Defense, Marine Corps Doctrinal Publication 8, Information, and the forthcoming Joint Naval Concept, Distributed Maritime Logistics Operations. In terms of force structure and equipment, the Marine Corps has divested itself of tanks, reflagged the 3rd Marine Regiment as the 3rd Marine and Littoral Regiment, and shifted the size of infantry battalions, helicopter squadrons, and fixed wing aircraft, among other changes. The human capital has been reinvested in other units. In the reserves, for example, the Marine Innovation Unit has been created. MIU seeks to collect widespread talent present in the reserves, especially that tied to science and technology, cyberspace, and robotics. These are skills many reserve Marines possess as a result of their civilian employment or self-study that do not translate easily into usable skills in an infantry company or truck platoon. The unit received almost five times as many applications as there were start as there were spots when it started forming. The third line of effort General Berger has emphasized is the need to experiment and refine the changes made. Experimentation at home station and in combined and joint exercises have helped improve the shifts made. As an example, the pre-designed for the pre-force design 2030 active duty infantry battalion had almost 900 Marines on its table of organization. Initial plans cut that number to 735. Two years of experience and experimentation has demonstrated the number should be somewhere between 800 and 835, a change that's being made. Similarly, the cannon artillery batteries initially were reduced down to five, but have now been increased to seven from the original 14. In 2022, seven major exercises have been designated as experimentation exercises to help prove or disprove the concepts and refine them thereafter of Force Design 2030. Like many corporate restructurings or institutional pivots, Force Design 2030 has not been without critics. The objections and those that do so, however, fall outside the scope of this paper. Regardless, if viewed as, regardless if viewed as positive or negative, there is little denying that General Berger is fundamentally reorganizing the Marine Corps. 
The 2020s are described by General Berger, quoting from the 2022 National Defense Strategy as a decisive decade. This is language echoed in other official US government statements and documents, including those involving climate change, interaction with China, and the Global Fragility, Ta Global Fragility Act. Collecting history amidst this change is quite a tall order. The Marine Corps History Division is a mixed civilian and uniformed personnel organization that serves as the memory and repository of the Marine Corps. Its website remarks, History Division's primary task has been to preserve and promulgate the official record of the Marine Corps in peacetime and war. In doing so, its archivists collect and maintain research materials, official documents, special collections, maps, oral histories, photos, and film and video, so that its historians might research and write official accounts on operational, institutional, and doctrinal topics and events, unit histories and lineage, and the establishment and life cycle of Marine Corps bases and stations. Excuse me. History division, indeed the entirety of collecting Marine Corps history, which is governed by Marine Corps Order 5750.1H, which fixes responsibilities and establishes policies for recording, preserving, and disseminating the cumulative operational institutional experience of the Marine Corps. From the beginning, 5750 establishes the connection between history and current operations. Quote, if the harsher lessons of history are not to be painfully revisited, the past must be extensively evaluated. Can deduct, to conduct such an evalu extensive evaluation, a systematic means of preserving historical records is needed. Toward that end, the Marine Corps has dedicated resources to amass, preserve, and use records and collections of historical value. End quote. This is not to be history in a vacuum, but rather history that informs and guides current and future operations. Of the eight objectives assigned to Marine Corps History Division in the order, Half are directly tied to modern and future war fighting. Like any good wire, like any good military briefing, this one wouldn't be complete without a good box and wire diagram showing the table of organization and force structure of history division, which is divided into three branches. First is history's branch, which writes the history of the Marine Corps for publication both internally and externally. Second is archives branch, which manages flat records such as papers and digital documentation. Three-dimensional objects, including uniforms, weapons, and flags, including the two famously raised over Iwo Jima, are managed by the National Museum of the Marine Corps. The third branch is the field history branch, which comprises of 17 reservists and in an individual mobilization augmentee unit. And you see here on this slide, you know, the, the breakdown between archives, histories, and field branch. Field history branch is commanded by a full 06 colonel, which has three teams and one joint team, which is what I'm part of down there in purple at the bottom, uh, who works both for history division and for the Joint History and Research Office uh, out of the Pentagon and the joint in support of the joint staff. This paper focuses on the role of the field history branch in the work of its reservists. The work produced by them since Force Design 2030 was initiated in 2019 and the changes we face and obstacles we've surmounted. A quick note about the Marines that make up field history branch. Uh, there's a photo of us last year. There are only 17 of us. Most of us are field grade officers or senior staff NCOs. So folks with 10 plus years of experience in the Marine Corps and operational forces. Um, as one could be expected, the Marine Corps being an, an organization predominantly focused on combat operations and, and ground combat, we are largely combat arms related. I'm an artillery officer by background. Most of uh, our commanders and infantry officer, a fair amount of the other historians are infantry officers. We have logisticians, military police, intelligence officers, uh, and aviators as well. So we cover the whole breadth and scope of the Marine Air Ground Task Force in terms of skill sets, but we are predominantly focused on combat operations uh, and ground combat operations in our in our backgrounds. That photo shows 13, but 17. That's all there are in terms of task and organized historians in the Marine Corps. 17 reservists trying to capture worldwide operational history of a force of almost 180,000 active duty and 38,000 plus reserve Marines. It's a tall order, but one largely that we've tried to succeed at, and I think as evidence will show we have. Since 9-11, approximately 10,750 oral history interviews have been conducted by members of the detachment. That averages to approximately 1.4 interviews every day in the last 20 plus years. Given that a reservist only has 48 four-hour drill periods a year, plus 12-day annual cycle 
plus a 12-day annual training cycle, this is an impressive number. The interviews themselves are mostly conducted at an unclassified level, though some, by their very nature, are classified. The intent is to conduct as many unclassified as interviews as possible so that they can be used to publish the official history of the Marine Corps, and that history can be shared as widely as possible with as many as possible. The majority of the field historians in the detachment are not historians by academic training. There are some who are academically trained historians, but this is most often is not a result of this is most often not as a result of the Marine Corps investing in advanced schooling, but rather something undertaken by the Marine at her or his own direction and expense. Instead, most of us attain, attend the U.S. Army's week-long military history detachment course conducted by the Center for Military History. The U.S. Army has been tasked by the Department of Defense with being the lead proponent for military history training across the uniformed services. The focus of the Marine History Detachment course is collecting oral history, artifacts, and photographs of current operations. And the field historians of the Marine Corps are largely focused on collecting oral histories of current operations. The slide you're seeing here is one of our summary sheets, one that I did in relationship to the evacuation of Hamid Karzai International Airport and the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. Oral history interviews are conducted by Marine Corps History Division field historians are submitted to archive branch along with a summary sheet and supplementary materials from the interview. Those usually include a biography and photo of the interviewee. Additionally, they also include scanned documents like cruise books, photographs, letters, emails, briefing slides, operations orders, etc. Basically, whatever we can get our hands on. These supplemental materials help flush out the delays uh, oh, help flush out the delays related in the interviews and the decisions related in the interviews or humanize the Marine narrative or the humanize the Marine narrative and the Marine interview. Additionally, we conduct interviews with former Marines and those affiliated with the Marine Corps, including family members, joints and combined service personnel assigned to Marine units or those who worked with them, including interpreters and foreign nationals and others that can help tell the story of the Marine Corps. We also collect and preserve artifacts docu and documents for the archives and museum enterprise. As an example of the recent work on what I call deep history, we've conducted in the past six months, we've interviewed three World War II women Marines, two of whom are over 100 years old. And you'll see uh, the photos of, of Elsie Finch there in the upper left-hand corner and Peg Biddle uh, in the bottom center. A number of, world, of other World War II Marines and a good number from Korea, Vietnam, and the Cold War. Our leads come in from a variety of sources to include children of these Marines, as was the case uh, with the Marine in the middle, newspaper articles, and word of mouth. As an example, I recently interviewed a Marine medically retired in 1966 after taking a machine gun round through his head in Vietnam, all because his son met a recruiter at a Starbucks a few days after I had spoken with the recruiter to let him know I was in the area. And in a feel-good story, I was able to have that Marine awarded a medal he had earned in 1966, but never received. Examples of documents collected and preserved include the wartime photo albums and letters of some of those World War II Marines, the letters of a wife of a Marine officer posted to China in 1919 to 1921, and documents related to the atomic tests conducted in the Nevada desert in the 1950s, with Marines serving as a maneuver force under the detonations. Collecting the legacy and heritage of the Marine Corps is important, and is important and certainly enjoyable, but as the Marine Corps order states, we are tasked with capturing current and operational history. Force Design 2030, as the closest thing we've seen to a paradigm shift since the fall of 2001, is indeed that current history. But reality sets in. Force Design, however, is hardly not the only thing occurring in the Marine Corps, nor has it been the only collection or effort or priority since General Berger became Commandant. Reality strikes and the limited number of historians, just 17 of us, are trying to capture everything we can. Since General Berger assumed commandancy, several significant events have also occurred, requiring our attention and focus. I'm going to break down these efforts and demonstrate the role Marine Corps field historians have played in capturing those stories and documenting war as it happens in real time. First, COVID-19. It would be hard to explain the impact of COVID-19 on collecting oral history interviews other than saying that if you can't travel or visit to your subjects, it can be hard to convince them to talk to you. While commercial applications like Zencaster or recording off of your phone do allow us to conduct virtual interviews, 
A variety of security measures make it difficult for reservists to access government computer networks or programs like Microsoft Team to conduct interviews using approved programs. The impact of COVID-19 on travel significantly reduced our efficiency. And when we, when we looked at our records, when, we, when I was coming up with this, you can see almost a, a six to eight month gap in interviews conducted because we were all trying to figure out COVID uh, and how to approach historical collections in, in serving at that time. Of note, however, is that a statistical analysis project was conducted and written by several field historians about COVID's impact on the efforts of Marine Corps Recruiting Command. The authors of that survey had previously served in Recruiting Command and were able to leverage that knowledge to produce something of immediate relevance and importance to the supporting establishment. This goes back to our background of having 10 plus years in the Marine Corps across the board um, to understand and have access to folks and have experienced in those uh, in those roles and recognizing what should be collected and what needs to be collected. Make sure I'm not running close to time. Two to three minutes left. Got it. Thanks, Mike. There was a coup in Burma. We'll quickly roll through that. Uh, and the evacuation of Hamid Karzai International Airport. In August 2021, the United States and our allies withdrew from Afghanistan after the Afghan government gave ground and eventually collapsed under Taliban pressure. As American forces were drawing down in Afghanistan, several Marine Corps units were placed on the ground to facilitate that drawdown and evacuation. Since the departure in Hamid Karzai, uh, of Hamid Karzai International Airport, the field historian branch has conducted approximately 200 interviews um, to include every Marine security guard at the US Embassy that was interviewed within days of arrival in the United States after the evacuation. The uniforms and equipment of the Marines standing guard on post one at the closing when the embassy closing announcement was made was were collected and donated to the museum because field history branch was there. We conducted approximately 20 interviews in that process. We've conducted interviews with members of the special purpose MAGTAF, Task Force 515 and the 24th MU who are on ground in Kabul to include those who were at the bombing blast at Abbey Gate. These range from a general officer present down or these range from a general officer down to the junior enlisted Marines who were present in Afghanistan months after completing boot camp, some of whom were born after 9-11. More, interviews, more interviewees have been identified and the process is ongoing. Uh, having done a number of these interviews, they are particularly, um, I'm going to say heavy. They're particularly impactful. I spent six months in Afghanistan in 2009 advising the Afghan security forces and to hear how it all went out uh, has been a very interesting thing. Once the evacuation was over, we started receiving evacuees uh, at Marine Corps Base Quantico. Logistics and engineer units from Camp Lejeune formed Task Force Quantico uh, to receive these refugees. And within 10 days of standing up that task force, we had a field historian on site conducting interviews with both the Marines and sailors of the task force, but also the evacuated Afghans. Um, so conducting immediate uh, analysis and immediate collection. In terms of force design, we've collected several major efforts, including looking at the Marine Rotational Force in Darwin, Australia, exercise cold response in 2022 well, in Northern Norway, where two historians attended the exercise and documented the variety of experimentation efforts, thinking back to General Berger's focus. Additionally, in one weekend uh, of drilling, we conducted 18 interviews over an hour long each with lead planners for force design 2030 and those impacted by it. Ultimately, the Marine Corps. Sure, I wrote out another thing. All right. Ultimately, the Marine Corps won't know if we are successful at the transition General Berger has implemented until the dust settles after the next war. In the aftermath of that conflict, the interviews and archival material collected by Marine Corps History Division's individual mobilization augmentee detachment will help historians piece together what worked, and hopefully, the fewer concepts that didn't. Thank you. Oh Thank goodness, Mike! Time. I am so sorry. <laughs> I think this is this is part of part of conferences is um, is uh, the stories we can tell about uh, whether or not we, we stayed at time. <clears throat> it's all, all fine. This was this was really fascinating. Um, I'm going to say that uh, about every paper uh, that gets presented today because they all are. Um, this was quite interesting in terms of you know that I, I think with a lot of people who would anybody who's read anything about how the Marine Corps learns is how it looks inwards and is able to uh, not 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 out of ignorance of everything that's going on out there but because it wants to understand how it works uh, 
um, and how it's worked. So this is this is really interesting, um, an interesting example of that. Um, I'm just going to shift right away to to Matthew, and then we'll do the Q and A afterwards. Um, Matthew, you are up. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'll try and get you back on track. Uh, that means I, that means that means I'll ad lib and uh, look at my watch and make, actually keep the timer on, which I've got uh, going now. Um, thanks both to Jeff and Tim. You've kind of set me up very nicely, I think, um, because uh, your descriptions of the hierarchical and bureaucratic structures necessary for collecting material so that the past might be recorded or the present might be understood is uh, really fascinating, really fascinating, because um, what I want to do here is discuss or talk about things like accidental archives. And in particular, what I mean by that is, is the sort of the sort of material that gets that comes out of uh, war that doesn't that isn't official, that gets stuck uh, in people's lofts and emerges later on uh, uh, as um, uh, parents and grandparents start reminiscing or talking about their, the, the war. And then framing that into um, a way we might think about future war. Uh, and I know that sounds like it might be a bit of a difficult leap, but principally I'm interested in um, how uh, things like smartphones are shaping our capacity to create accidental archives, to create uh, um, representations of war that will that are now, in my opinion, going to dominate how we think about future war, how we how future war is represented uh, and will make the process of writing future history really, really complicated. And I think that's why um, my, the conflict, the conflict records unit is really important. It's clearly something that's very, very important now in the context of the war in Ukraine. And it's something that uh, my Andrew Hoskins and I have been uh, thinking about for the last couple of years which has led to producing this book called Radical War. Yes, that is a gratuitous attempt on my part to flog copy at you all, and it's only 20 quid, but it's also me trying, uh, making sure that I acknowledge Andrew uh, as my co-author uh, and who has been very important in framing some of the thoughts that I put to you uh, this morning. Um, so what I really want to do is contrast what might be described as an establishment history uh, uh, with how we might reflect on contemporary or present uh, collections of uh, materials that in the past would have been described as accidental archives. They wouldn't have been very accessible. But of course, now they are very, very, very accessible and very, very present. They're right in your palm of your hand. Uh, the smartphone allows us to see the war and see wars in all sorts of ways that um, previously weren't able to do. Um, and it's that. Uh, I suppose that's the, the, the point of contrast, I guess, between uh, um, a, 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 an analogue history of war and might you nicely set up how um, your work in Iraq involves digitising a lot of material. Um, I think what I want to sort of start off by sort of um, getting you to think about is, is that if the past was framed by paper, magnetic tape, uh, recordings of things, um, uh, um, microfiche and all of that. Um, now, of course, things are being recorded all the time and that has created exponential growth in data to the point of just a little fact that I want you to keep in mind. Uh, and this, and, and the reason I'm only referencing the war in Ukraine here, principally because we, Andrew and I wrote this book, Radical War, before the war in Ukraine. And uh, the last, uh, three or four months we've been stressing about how wrong this how wrong radical war is and actually surprisingly there's a load of things in that have been happening that make us think actually we, we weren't so far off the off the money in terms of um, the challenges of trying to understand uh, how connectivity and digitization are going to and are reshaping how we've come to uh, think about represent and understand and make sense of war in, in the 21st century the, the first stat I want you to think about is in, in Ukraine, 85% of the population have uh, access to mobile uh, broadband connectivity. Um, uh, so that's the first thing I want you to think about. The second is, is that the NGO, the Ukrainian NGO Mnemonics, and Andrew mm -hmm. was um, good enough to 
uh, had spoken to Numonix because he's got lots of connections with um, friends and, 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 and colleagues in Ukraine, um, established that, uh, there, the, that um, the, war in, uh, the civil war in Syria produced something like 40 years worth of footage over a 10 year civil war. The astonishing truth of 80 days of war in Ukraine right now is, is that it has produced 20 years of footage. 20 years of footage. I mean, that is enormous. Uh, and when Andrew wrote his PhD uh, way back in the 1990s, he was talking about how the amount of footage that came out of uh, the Gulf War was something in the, in the realms of 200 hours of VHS. You know, and that really makes it very, that, that really contrasts how an analog period of creating um, uh, uh, news, information, archives, things that would shape people's understanding of war compares with um, the 21st century, uh, the process of um, where, where smartphone technology and connectivity is just mundane, right? So um, I think that that really, that, that point here is really important because I've, I've talked about mainstream media here on the left and user-created media on the right um, through connectivity and smartphone technology. But if you think about it, mainstream media and what uh, both Tim and Jeff were describing, that, you know, the, in an analog age, we're talking about a very, very hierarchical structure. Lots of lots of bureaucracy, lots of different layers, lots of people making choices that conform with some sort of editorial process or policy or a set of ambitions that shape and frame what ends up in the archive. Whereas it, it, user-created media is being produced published and consumed every single second and moment of the day, right? It's, it, it, and, we're to, and of course it's being uploaded to social media and we think we might be seeing the war in an, uh, wars in Ukraine and elsewhere in Syria or whatever in an unmediated way. We're just seeing it being presented to us. But I think we need to reflect on the fact that that's, that's not quite the case. Um, uh, I spoke to some people in the open source intelligence community and it, it was clear that stuff that was coming up and getting published online was maybe 20, sometimes 24 to 48 hours behind actual events. So, you know, whilst we might think it is, um, uh, the war is being represented online, um, or wars are being represented online in, in immediacy, they, that's not necessarily the case. Now, um, that Im the implication of all this is that, that we have, that, and the connectivity is, is that even if material, what material doesn't get published online there's a lot of material on people's on people's phones recorded and and, and kept uh, in the background and that stuff is going to creep out and it's shaping uh how we might think about war crimes tribunals um uh it's also shaping how we come to remember and uh, and make it will shape how we come to remember and make sense of war and what it does is, is it produces a constant churn of uh material that sort of upends and destabilizes and creates a dialectic, if you like, with establishment or received views, those sorts of mainstream media or the, the, the views that might come out of um, uh, uh, governmental organizations, which can be very quickly contrasted with what's going on uh, as it's being represented online. And that creates a sense of a very strong sense of uncertainty or dysphoria. It creates distorting prisms, and social media, of course, is a great place for those sorts of distorting prisms. Um, and this sets the context, if you like, for what we might describe as the, the new media ecology, which is forms, frames, forms, and is framing how the new war ecology works. It's that combination of uh, uh, government structures, establishment views, mainstream media and social media, and a reflection that the sort of sedimented understanding of the past, as it might be framed by the kinds of analog uh, efforts that were being put in place by, as Jeff articulated very nicely, and, as, and, and of course Tim is trying to bridge between the, the, uh, the analog and the, um, and the digital, uh, it sort of this 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 sets the context in which everyone is participating in this uh, um, uh, this war, and you can see it. The pictures down the bottom, you know, we've got GoPro cameras in in Syria, all the way to uh, even in Northern Ireland, people are recording things on their smartphones or looking at prisoners of war in the recent Armenia Azerbaijan war. And it creates war is in that that sense is always on, and as as we've seen. Uh, uh, Russian armed forces have struggled uh, to shut down internet connectivity uh, 
in in Ukraine, and that 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 results in this sort of collapse of different uh, ways of framing or thinking about how we might make sense of war between what we know in terms of our a general understanding about how war works with what we're seeing and what we're seeing is uh, I think some Jay Winter would describe what we're seeing is, is that the, the the studium of war that received establishment view is in direct dialectic with the punctum of war with the with the stuff that's coming up from the battlefield where it's horrific and unpleasant and doesn't conform with an establishment view and so you get this really very interesting contrast of of war as it's represented in mainstream media which is sanitized and uh, doesn't show us in all its gruesome details all of the unpleasantries of war, but also um, uh, also focuses on specific areas and issues that are of direct interest to their audiences, contrasted with what's coming up through uh, uh, channels like Telegram, which is just there's you know it's it's some of it is really horrific. Um, and of course, that's being done in a context where it, it, um, establishment approaches to uh, recording archives is being challenged by digital media itself. So um, we are seeing a lot of data loss uh, in, in organizations and that's some of that's perfectly normal. You know, it's not possible as, as Tim very nicely put, you know, there are 17 historians uh, in the US Marine Corps. It is impossible to capture everything. And some of that is as it has always been. But it's also the case that the media itself lend itself to creating sort of memory holes where data gets lost and people don't know where material is and you know you don't have to I've I've how many times have I lost music on um through digital rights management changes on my uh my um my iCloud account right um so that kind of data gets lost all the time and on top of that you know in in military organizations there is a sometimes a real challenge in terms of putting in place the bureaucratic structures in order to sustain that the, the gathering of material. And in the UK, for example, a lot of effort has been put into trying to manage how the uh, Ministry of Defence Ministry of Defense defends itself against uh, war crimes tribunals, war crimes accusations against British Army, British military personnel themselves. So I'm thinking Baha Musa, or I'm thinking about the Al Swedi case. Both of those are really instructive because they tell us something about how evidence is being pulled through and into uh, and collected and then made available for uh, uh, government later on to defend itself. And what you see is, of course, in the, if you go back to the Al Swedi, Al Swedi inquiry, what you see is, is a whole series of uh, databases and hard drives being um, deleted. Now, uh, and that's partly just a function of how uh, smart uh, hard drives are being repurposed as much as it is the infrastructure challenge of actually collecting that material and recording and storing it somewhere indexing it making it available and I think that's something that Tim can clearly talk about in great detail um, so we have this we have this curious uh, uh, yes and we have so we have this curious cascading if you like of the the analog as we as established as, as scholars we might be familiar with, as historians we might be familiar with, with our contemporary experience, which is around how we know actually people are engaging with the world through their smartphones in the terms of produce, consuming, producing, publishing material, all on one device, uh, which they can, which people can clearly do right at the front lines and they can do, um, uh, and they can amplify when they're back in their, uh, back at home, on the train, on the tube, or whatever. Uh, and that creates this swirling, churning effect that is very, very distorting and very, very uh, uh, difficult to understand and make sense of. And it creates this curious situation um, where we have traditional archives that take all this effort to try and sustain and make and build and curate, uh, combined with um, combined with bureaucratic structures that are themselves struggling to deal with processes of digitization, uh, where uh, the process of digitization are indeed disintermediating traditional uh, pro uh, approaches to uh, uh, collecting uh, archive material, making sense of it. And, uh, and, and they're doing that in the context of an exponential growth in, in digital media that is you know, really, really challenging to try and make sense of. Um, and of course, that's all being produced not by in official contexts, but out in the out in the real world amongst people who are just recording on a mundane level everyday life and so you create this 
this situation that John Spencer, um, who people in the States will maybe be a bit more familiar with than uh, in the UK, I don't know, where you've got this, you can learn as, it's very easy to get a sense as to what's going on in the past from, and you know, you see it all the time online uh, where uh, archives are being uploaded or maps are being put online where you can trace out uh, uh, wars previous. But when it comes to actually making sense of stuff that's right now and in immediately, that becomes very, very challenging. And uh, just let me turn my alarm off and I finished. How about that? Matthew, your and my alarm were synchronized perfectly. Uh, thanks very much. That was a really good um, uh, wrap up in a sense or, or tying together of threads. Um, uh, I'll keep my own observations for later. If I could ask the panelists, all of you to, you've already done it, uh, enable your, your video. Uh, we've got two questions and, and we've only really got two uh, time for, for two questions. And we need to keep answers fairly brief so that we can have that short pause before the next panel in 20 minutes or so. One question is from an audience member and one is from one of the other panelists, Victoria. Uh, I'll start with the uh, the uh, with the audience. Uh, thank you, Elahe. Uh, apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, the question is, the comment in the question is, many thanks for the interesting and informative uh, talks. Uh, there was a close, there, there was close intelligence co uh, collaboration between uh, US and UK during the 20s and 30s. Uh, covering other parts of the world, so so Middle East and China are specifically mentioned here. Could you comment on this relationship and guidance on finding books and sources of information on this topic? So keeping it within the, I mean that that that's that's a big question, and the reading lists are quite long. I would I would uh, I know, and I would imagine. Um, uh, you know the, the the examples that come to mind are you know Jeff, you mentioned the you know radio broadcasting. That that was a fantastic and longstanding collaboration between U.S. and U.K on um, collecting information, specifically radio broadcasts and other kinds of broadcasts, and where there was you know, an, an agreement, a sharing agreement, basically, or a division of labor between you know, the Foreign Broadcast Information Service in the US and BBC monitoring. And they basically divided up the world and then shared sort of the results. Um, I, I, I suppose the question is really for you guys. Um, if you wanted to comment on that, I, I, the way to expand that a little bit is, uh, you know, th this first panel is really the, the the title sort of says it all, and it's not meant to skew the entire day, but it is looking at some, some of the origins or some of the early practices that we see being much more broadly used uh, outside of a, a US, UK slash Anglo kind of American you know, transatlantic context. Um, and and so, so it is a heavy, heavy US focus initially, but the, the question is, you know what? What are what are some of the non-U.S. corollaries? I, I, I think not to get too far away from from our our audience member's question, uh, but looking at um, how that collaboration worked in other parts of the world and how other parts of the world have done this. I suppose those would be the two parts of the question. Um, if you guys want to, if you if you would like to comment on that, and then I'll uh, let's say thirty to forty five seconds each, and then I'll come back to Victoria's question. Shall I go first? Go ahead. Jeff, Tim, Matthew. Yeah, so I mean, in answer to the question, uh, to be honest, I'm not that familiar with the 20s and 30s. My, if I had to give a sh very short one word answer, I would say, you know, or short answer, not much, if any. Um, and that's principally because uh, at that time, the people who would actually be uh, acquiring that sort of information from a US perspective would have been the military attaches, and there weren't very many of them, uh, you know, maybe 30 or so around the world. And most of those were based in Europe, you know, some in Latin America. And, Few elsewhere, but it wasn't the sort of information that they were, were 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 really collecting, except perhaps to some extent newspapers locally, and then sort of just tossing them into the garbage can probably afterwards, uh, after they've written their reports of anything that interesting that's been going on. But in terms of actual collaboration, certainly U.S. U.K. collaboration on that topic during that period, I would have to say probably none. I'm sort of afraid of saying none because maybe there's a small bit somewhere, but I suspect it was it, it was it was very very limited indeed. Uh, but very, very quickly afterwards, um, so you're talking about Phibis, for example, I didn't really see very much in terms of collecting of, 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 of documents, of newspapers and that sort of thing. I think there was probably you know, sort of a little bit of collaboration here and there, uh, 
more likely um, not centrally directed per se, uh, but more out in the field. I read one memoir of a British diplomat who was based in Moscow, who said that one of his part-time jobs in Moscow was collecting this sort of material for the British government, um, going to bookstores and so forth, but he was sort of rather envious that the Americans had three people and he was only doing it part-time. Uh, but how much they actually collaborated in that sense, I think, again, it was sort of fairly minimal. Some people out in the field who, who did this rather than something that was centrally uh, directed. But one last point on this, which I'll make in relation to China. Um, when I was doing my research on this, one of the key gaps that I came across was that, you know, the U.S. was doing a lot of this on its own. Uh, I couldn't really see very much information or even hints that other embassies in Beijing that existed at the time, whether it was the British or the French or whoever, were actually going around and collecting this information for the Americans and then giving it to them. Um, again, maybe there was some of that going on, but it didn't make it into the reporting, at least not that I saw back. The, 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 the emphasis was always on what the US was collecting through its smuggling operations, uh, not via liaison uh, operations, or li liaison or, or arrangements. I'll stop there. Thanks, Jeff. Tim? I have I'm not, not much to say in collaboration, though. Uh, it was quite exciting to see the Modern War Institute. So thank you, Dr. Ford. That's my day job. Um, so thank you for that. All right, thanks, Tim. Matthew? No problem, Tim. Happy to always give plugs to worthy places and institutions. Um, uh, what I'd say is uh, I think I, I can't speak to the, the, the question from the 20s and 30s, but your broader point about collaboration I, I mean, I've been talking to a lot of different companies recently, and it seems to me that there's a sort of public-private shift in terms of how data is being accessed and made available and then used to frame intelligence activities. Uh, and that seems to me to be cutting across... Um, that seems to me to be... I mean, I'm not ruling out that, of course, there are all the establishment... Uh, you know, approaches between different agencies or the rest of it, but it's surprising how much can be gleaned just from publicly available material. And I'm thinking of a company called Anomaly Six, which can basically uh, track your uh, mobile phone, all of the Twitter, all of your social media feeds, and locate you, geolocate you in time, uh, so that and, and reveal your identity, uh, all from open source material, and effectively allow them to track. Uh, you, you know, Russian and Chinese troop movements. Uh, and it's that, that that level of public data and the processing power that's needed to do all of that strikes me as being really a shift in that public-private relationships that is not between states, but does ref reflect a new, a, a, a changing pattern of, of power, I think, in, in the global system. Okay, thanks, thanks, Matthew. Uh, I want to shift quickly to the questions from uh, um, your sorry, fellow panelists. Just, Joe, I see your hand up. Do you want to jump I just want in? To, uh, not to jump in or to cut Victoria's question off, just to get in the queue behind her. Okay. All right. Um, so the, the question from Victoria is basically, how do, how do you, if I remember, let, let me just go straight to it so I don't uh, misremember, uh, is generally about conflict sensitivity. Um, how do you how do you deal with conflict sense? I, I think it was a question directed at Tim initially. Um, what what sort of con conflict sensitivity training are your historians given prior to doing their work or as part of their work? I think probably it's worth spreading that question out a little bit uh, and directing it to everybody. Kind of conflict sensitivity is a big part of research as is done within the development sector. It's a big part of what uh, how the UN you know any sort of human rights sensitive um, uh, uh, enterprise will, will seek to intervene, whether it's to collect information or to deploy resources or whatever. And the idea is to, is to minimize harm, is to not make things worse, is to not put people in a position uh, that they will incur harm by virtue of having you know, responded to an oral history survey or taken a, a donation of, of material resources or what have you. So I guess, uh, not, Tim, not to put you in, a, in an awkward position because you're, the focus of your paper was quite specific on a, you know, an, an internal looking or an inward looking 
uh, collection enterprise where this may not be appropriate, but, but I think it probably still comes into play if you think about the question in, in broader terms. How do, how do historians go about doing their work without getting in the way of what's you know the normal day-to-day -day activities, I guess, in the context of the Marine Corps, but also, um, you know, Jeff, Jeff, and Matthew, how do how do you know collection efforts or or efforts to preserve uh, preserve information, acquire information? How's that done in a way? Is it done in a way to minimize disruption or 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 to sort of I don't know? I I, I think it's a, probably a tricky kind of question depending if you're talking about something that's part of the intelligence function where you know some of that will be it'll be framed very differently uh, versus you know the the sort of outsourced um, social media approach to very very specifically um, uh, organized archival efforts for example where do no harm actually applies in a different way and it's about preserving the integrity of a collection as it exists as a collection so it can be sort of it's a kind of question that can be understood a bunch of different ways and I suppose after after spreading that out a little bit, I'm just wondering if you guys want to, if you'd like to comment on, on that. There's another question from Victoria about verification authentication, which I think sort of comes into that. Sure. Um, uh, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll take the lead on that. Um, one of the things that I, could, I didn't cover in my thing was as the events in Afghanistan were unfolding in last summer, we made a concerted effort to try to get a historian into Afghanistan to document in real time what was happening at Hkaya, at Bagram, um, or even just get them into Bahrain. And ultimately that wound up failing for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the things we consistently run into is we are asking permission to come and observe and collect. Um, and at what point are we a value add in the immediacy? You know, if, if I'm a commander and I have the choice between bringing some historian and his or her cameras and audio recording equipment and stuff or another staff officer or planner or whatever i'm going to probably err on the side of the staff officer um and so we have we have an obligation and a duty to sell ourselves um it's exciting to hear, you know, our, our civilian oral historian was at Modern Day Marine Expo and ran into the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, right? So he's the Commandant's senior enlisted advisor, and he knew that she existed, um, which is huge to have that level of almost access, but convincing the operational units, hey, you actually do want to take me because I bring something to you. And so when we go to do our pitch, uh, to, to talk to units about joining them for an exercise or, or, or you know, even getting to be, you know, try to be seen as nothing other than another dang mouth to feed. Um, we talk about preserving both the legacy and heritage of what they're doing, but also protecting those Marines in the future. So I mentioned earlier the atomic tests. If there was a historian there, we now have, you know, copies of the rosters and copies of this and that and the other thing. And when you go to do your claim because you have some rare cancer that all of your buddies also have, we have the evidence. And it's interesting how that phrase of I'm protecting your Marines in the future turns commanders heads. Um, the other thing very quickly aside, while our interviews are conducted at the unclassified level and we look to do, um, to get them published and, and to, to have them incorporated into written product produced history uh, to, to Dr. Ford's kind of cycle models, um, access to those are restricted. So when we interviewed the Afghans, right, when you saw the summary sheet, I blanked out the name of the interviewee that I did. Um, the, the Afghans we interviewed, you know, those are, you have to request them from history divisions, archives, there's a process, there's a vetting to make sure that your means are legitimate. You know, not, nobody can, you just can't walk off the street and ask for them. So that's some of how we do it. Thanks, Tim. Quick responses from Jeff and Matthew, and then Joe's question, and then we need to break for no, it's perfect. Uh, and then, and then we need to make space for the next the next panel. Jeff, and then Matthew. Uh, actually, I'm going to pass on this one if you don't mind. <laughs> so, quick one. Well done, Jeff. Uh, quick one uh, from me then. Um, clearly, sensitivity issues are not being in a 21st century context. Sensitivity issues are not being framed by well, they're partly being framed by our choices in terms of what we allow to allow ourselves to see online, um, but they're also crucially um, defined 
in by the platform at platform level. Uh, so, you know, Twitter. There's a reason why Twitter and Facebook and the rest of it are mainstream social media, and they don't you don't see the war very much. And that's because they're in a constant fight to keep that stuff off off the platforms. Um, the flip side is, is Telegram doesn't have such uh, 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 tight policy, uh, policies on what is um, put online, and the war is seen in all its glory there. Uh, so wars are seen in, all, in di so different platforms, different. I mean, and that's the other thing about the um, twenty foot. How do you make sense of and in a context in which you've got you know twenty or so different social media platforms, uh, all framing producing content uploaded content you know that that just really does challenge all things around sensitivity because if you really want to go hunt for stuff you can definitely find it um uh yeah that's all i'll say because i can see we're running out of time okay thanks matthew joe go ahead you're muted joe First, first, first mention of somebody being muted. <laughs> quick, uh, uh, I think that means you all drink at this point. Uh, a <laughs> uh, 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 quick comment for Jeff. So the um, Jeffrey Heard, Margaret Thatcher's foreign secretary, participated in a witness seminar that I was at, and I think is recorded, where he describes the reestablishment of the UK embassy to the PRC, and talks about how he spent most of his time looking through guidebooks so he could put in requests to go visit. Uh, shrines or historical sites so they could collect scraps of newspapers on trains. Uh, so there was definitely some kind of official or unofficial U uh, UK collection of precisely the sort of, and this is, would be er uh, uh, just after Korean War, so uh, um, mid to late 50s where they were, they were doing that. Um, Tim, um, I'd be really interested just to open up a conversation. I'm, unfortunately, time is pressing, but with, with um, Ma Matthew's paper, uh, uh, and I just ask you a, a straightforward question: What, how do you handle all that material on the phones of Marines? And uh, obviously, there are questions about uh, 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 the ethics, the legality, and whether or not. And obviously, there are operational orders governing whether they're bringing them and that sort of thing. But just a question about: Do you actually collect it? Is it there? And, and when it by default arrives or is available, do you collect it? And then, Matt, uh, you you intriguingly brought up this question, uh, the issue of there's a time lag between when it seems like material is being post, uh, recorded in um, uh, uh, the current uh, uh, conflict in Ukraine, Russia, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, uh, uh, and that there's a time lag. And perhaps you just elaborate, is that uh, a, a general, is that, in other words, is that being governed by the uh, service providers uh, uh, and it's quite deliberate? Yeah, okay, you're, you're nodding. So anyway, so I'll leave it at that. Great questions, by the way. Uh, can okay, I just quick response from Tim and then uh, to the first question and then Matthew Jeff after that? 30 to 45 seconds, please. Sorry. All right. Sorry about that, Jeff. Um, phones, what is on the phones, very, very difficult uh, to, to sort out. I view my job as I'm trawling. I'm just throwing my net out and whatever comes in, I collect and I will let the professional civilian historians sort out what to do with it, but I collect it. Um, there was guidance coming out of H. Kaya and the evacuation there. Hey, you don't have these things, don't share them, da 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 da. Ran into some issues there because we knew stuff was on phones and some Marines would share and some wouldn't. Um, but it's very individual. But I view my job as just to, I'm just sucking everything up. <laughs> I'm the NSA, I guess. <laughs> Tim, if I could just throw in just a quick 15 second comment. What I thought was striking about the paper was on the one hand, thinking of Matthew's work and the volume implied or, or not implied, but mentioned in Jeff's work is that the focus, the narrow focus on a particular tool, oral histories, right? Has everybody thinking, yeah, but what about everything else? Except the volume, the number of interviews that, that has been you know, collected over 20 years is remarkable. Um, and, and so, so there's, you know, you need to sort of take one in, in, in context of the other and, and sort of maybe not, not complain so much that we can't have everything, but we've got a lot of one thing. Um, Matthew and, and Jeff, if you had something to add, I'm not sure if you did. Uh, Matthew, go ahead. And then we're going to break and provide space for panel two. So I love the Marine Corps phone uh, question because uh, that's what, exactly what I'm interested in and um, where the policies are on all of that and where it all ends up 
and whether it just gets left on people's hard drives or whatever in, in the cloud or whatever. Um, the sensitivity issue, the 24, the how long it takes for materials to come up. Yes, some of, I mean, clearly some of that is algorithmically driven, um, but also it fits, it, it is also algorithmically driven in a way that um, gives time for the information operations that are coming out of places like Ukraine, right? So 24 hour gap allows narratives to be, um, try, I mean, they, I think it's a forlorn hope in some ways. It's like pushing water uphill, but you're, you're trying to get, if you've got the IT army of Ukraine working, then you can potentially flood social media with a particular set of perspectives. One of those was initially the war in Finland, the, the Finnish Soviet war. Everyone was talking about that. You know, as far as, as a framing for how the war, how war in Ukraine was working, it struck me as being utter nonsense. But, you know, everyone bought into it. And, you know, next thing you know is, is everyone was talking about that. So, I you know, that is where that that 24 hour gap and you can see. And of course, different social media platforms, you, you have to pay attention to the provenance of some of this material, where it starts, how it moves through different platforms and how it ends up in mainstream social media, because that's also part of the delay. But it's also part of the way of being in a position where you can deny things or you can reframe uh, 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 narratives. And I uh, just quickly, there's a good example. Um, there was a, um, I got uh, sent by an anonymous account a, um, on Twitter, a, 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 an image of a Ukrainian talking to a Russian mother about their, um, their son that had died in the war. And uh, I was like, this is really horrific stuff. I got a friend of mine who's, um, who speaks Russian to translate. And I was like, okay, they are really, it is really horrific. But then um, I got another friend of mine who works on uh, tracing this stuff. And what they found was is the video itself came from Russia first, then went to China, then went through India, and then got uploaded to social media via India. And you see, just when, you, how many people on a immediate 24 seven basis go to the level of effort that I did to try and understand the provenance of that image? Because I just thought this is such horrific stuff. We need to understand where it's coming from. And I was really surprised. Uh, as to how it ended up on my timeline and then it made me think well why am i being targeted what is it that they think i am going to do in terms of amplifying this particular message or story brilliant thanks thanks matthew jeff did you want to add something or yeah just three very quick things first uh, i cannot recommend state department oral diplomatic histories uh, enough they're absolutely superb uh when it comes to the interwar period i, I apologize joe i should have just sort of said, you know, you're the world expert on that subject, so uh, you can talk about it more than I can. But just one point that Joe raised, which I'll, I'll just quickly touch upon, um, in terms of sort of allied diplomats working in various countries the US doesn't have access to, uh, I remember coming across a very interesting uh, discussion of a Canadian diplomat talking about, he was based in Havana, talking about his experience of basically picking up uh, Cuban uh, publications wherever he could find them and sending them back, and that was supposedly at the behest of a uh, Canadian US intelligence cooperation. But at the same time, um, I remember going through the records of the British uh, consulate in, in, in Hanoi, um, or legation in Hanoi, I can't remember what the, what, the, what the official version of it was, but basically I think there was some concern that if they were collecting this information and passing it on to the Americans, it would somehow get back to them so that there was actual reluctance in some cases to actually collect this sort of information. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>